Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining PHCA for today's webinar, Quality and Value, the Future of Medicare, and Your Role Within It. I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to, prov to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for PHCA members. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two weeks for those who have provided us with your unique NAB number. I'll be sending a link to a quick survey. Your feedback is important to us and our speakers, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions using your questions pane on the right hand of your screen, and our presenter will address them at the end of the presentation. Now for today's webinar. This webinar is being presented by Maureen McCarthy. With so much writing on quality and value, it is imperative that facilities understand how they are being evaluated based on these metrics and what efforts can be implemented now to safeguard their success in the future. This webinar will help guide you through the healthcare, the new healthcare reform efforts and alternative payment methods as CMS moves away from a resource utilization reimbursement system. Specifically, SNF VBP and SNF QRP programs and how these programs will influence nursing documentation and quality reporting. I'll now turn the webinar over to Maureen. Thank you, Wendy. Um, as Wendy mentioned, my name is Maureen McCarthy. I'm the president of Celtic Consulting. Um, I've been in a nurse for, I've been actually in long-term care for 30 years. My background is an MDS coordinator, uh, director of nursing, rehab director, and a Medicare biller. Um, so I've sort of run the gamut of long-term care. I think the dietary might be the only department I, I didn't work in, that and maintenance. Um, I am an ANAC uh, master teacher for both the MDS process as well as for the American Association of Directors of Nursing for the QAPI process. I certify folks in QAPI, so I'm a master teacher for that, as well as director of nursing certification. Um, our company really focuses on five-star quality improvement, auditing, clinical management, PDPM preparation, compliance, you know, those types of things. So today we're going to be talking about Medicare's quality reporting program as well as the uh, the QRP program and the value-based purchasing programs. Um, and and as, when she, as Wendy mentioned earlier, you're getting one CEU, but I have to tell you this is probably the hardest you'll ever work for one CEU in your life. So there's a lot of material to go over. Um, these are pretty comprehensive programs. So if you have questions, again, you know, feel free to ask and we'll, and we'll get to those questions to make sure everyone understands the concepts we're reviewing. We'll talk about identi um, identifying correction opportunities for your quality data. There's a it's a little bit more limited in the value-based purchasing program than it is in the quality reporting program, but we will show you some of those reports and when the deadlines are for uh, making corrections. We'll talk about what the number one measure is as far as the quality measures go that overlaps the majority of programs and that, you know, if you only have one quality measure that you need that you're allowed to focus on, um, we'll talk about what this one is. And then we're gonna be talking about next steps towards improvement and some ways that you could sort of be proactive and sort of review your data um, to get a really good handle on um, you know, improving your quality outcomes. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about the SNF QRP program or the quality reporting program. This is different than Five Star or the quality measures, although the measures sound the same. So it's confusing sometimes for folks um, when they hear you know, uh, the percentage of pressure ulcers in the facility, that's measured in many different programs and measured in different ways in different programs. So 
many times folks will ask me, well, how come my numbers on this side don't don't match my numbers on this, you know, on this other reporting program? And the answer is because they're measuring either two different populations, two different points in time, or two different types of um, quality outcomes. So we'll talk about those. So the QRP program came from the Impact Act or the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014. It was a very um, legislative year, let's say. Um, and so the triple, CMS has a triple aim, which they want us to improve the health care for other members of that folks that have Medicare, so the beneficiaries. They want us to involve the residents in their care, um, which you can see through baseline care plan and setting resident goals in your care plan. So we're getting more of the residents' voice and choice. Some of these sections of the MDS have interviews, which get us more of the residents' voice and choice. And then the third uh, component of the triple aim is to reduce costs. Well, that's all well and good, but how are we going to get there? So the Impact Act helps, helps us to understand how we will get to the triple aim. So it's calling for certain things like data element uniformity. What that means is they're going to be continually changing out questions in the MDS assessment that are going to be matching other um, industry assessments. So for instance, the inpatient rehab facilities have an assessment that they call the inpatient rehab uh, patient assessment instrument or the IRF PI. So they'll switch out questions from that tool into our tool or from our MDS into their IRF PI tool. Same thing with the LTAX. You know, they have the care tool and that's where we got section GG, met much of that information. So we can expect that further down the road, CMS will continue to add different components into the MDS so that when they have this data, it's standardized across inpatient rehab, um, LTAX, skilled nursing, home health. So we're answering the same questions with the same coding system on the patient so they can track them throughout the continuum of care. Another piece is looking at quality care and improved outcomes, which obviously this QRP program is one of the components of that. So when you're looking at the QRP program, there is a financial um, incentive or disincentive, so to speak, that if we are not reporting quality, we can lose 2% of our Medicare revenue. And that's sort of the slap on the wrist for not doing the reporting components here. They also are looking at comparison of data across the continuum. So not just are we reporting on the same patient with the same tools throughout inpatient rehab and SNF and home health, but also looking at who does it better. So if an inpatient rehab facility is getting $900 a day from Medicare and an LTAC is getting $750 a day and a skilled nursing facility is getting $500 a day and we all get the same patient and we all can have the same outcome, um, or even if we can get better outcomes than some of the other entities, then we'll be the ones that survive because we can still have those really good positive outcomes for our patients, but we're also a cost saving uh, component to Medicare because we're, we cost less than the other levels of care to maintain that patient and to be able to get them to that, uh, that prior level of functioning. So they'll compare us to you know, how others um, are able to get patients back out into the community. Improved discharge planning, we can see that even just through some of the five-star measures with the claims-based components, looking at returns to the hospital, you know, your readmissions. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, this, after, this morning. Talking about um, emergency room use and successful discharge to the community. They're forcing us to collaborate with our downstream users. And those folks are our home health companies. They, it might be an outpatient rehab. It might be you know, someone that's just going back out to the, to the community with a caregiver, with a home caregiver, not through a home health agency. But again, they're forcing us to um, look at how we manage patients, not just the time that we have them, but also for a 30-day window post-discharge. Okay, so we're held accountable for what happens to patients in that 30 day window. So if they go back to the hospital, we get dinged for that. If they go back to the emergency room, you know, we're looking at certain components of managing patients and um, improving that discharge planning. So it's not just transitioning from the hospital to us. It's also when we transition patients to the next level, the next downstream user, how you know good we are at that and, um, and how much we're maintaining that information for that next downstream user. Exchangeability of data is a little more um, difficult because of HIPAA being so tight. Um, it's difficult for us. We may have access into some of the hospitals to see some of their 
um, records, but we don't necessarily have access into home health. So they're trying to make it so we have exchangeability of data. We're likely probably going to be using another type of a tool um, that will be outside of our MDS uh, for that component. But there is a technical expert panel that CMS is working with that they're studying that feasibility now for that transitional care planning and exchangeability of data. Right now, they're really looking at um, med lists and med medication information as well as the patient's care plan to go with them. And then the final piece is coordinating the care. OK, as we're coordinating upstream, downstream users, discharge planning, outcomes, those sort of things, coordinating the care with all of our entities where we get the patients from and the folks that we discharge the patients to. CMS is phasing this in over five years. So when we come to 2020, that will be the fifth year. So I imagine there will be a, um, a bit of an overhaul at that point. They have to report data back to you within two years of the inception of the measures. So they started the program in 2016 when we got Section GG um, on October 1st. They've added other quality measures throughout the years, which we'll we will review. And now they're looking at additional quality measures. They're considering health acquired um, infections as one of the uh, quality measures. So similarly to what we see in the hospitals where they get a certain amount of dollars for their rate and then they get a reduction in that rate based on their quality declining. Um, and that's what the quality reporting program is going to be for us in long-term care as well. Right now, it's a compliance issue, meaning that you have to fill out the information that's required. Eventually, we, it will be an outcome measure um, where they're going to use the information and your outcomes to compare you to other long-term care facilities or skilled nursing facilities to see, are you in alignment with others that have similar case mix acuity in their facilities? So looking at the measures, what's being measured under QRP currently, um, you have functional status and conditions that are, you're looking at those conditional um, changes for function and cognition from admission to discharge. That's your section GG information. They've added some components to section GG and we'll be talking about some other measures as we move along in the QRP program that are looking at having some additional measures about section GG um, that have been measured since October 1st of this year. But we'll talk about that. So Section GG initially started 10 1 and we were um, requested by CMS to record information. So we just needed to complete those boxes to get credit for it. We're allowed to dash all but one goal. Residents are expected to have at least a minimum of one goal in the Section GG. Um, and they can have more than one goal. And, what, and we'll be talking about in a few minutes that um, they're going to separate those so two sections and look at the outcomes separately from the mobility section to the self-care section. So you might want to consider, you know, setting a goal in each one of the sections. Another component is the uh, skin integrity and skin changes. We were looking at newer worsening pressure ulcers. Um, from October 1st of 2016, that's when that was initiated. As of this past October 10 one they've added unstageable pressure ulcers due to slough or eschar into that component. So if you're looking at your five-star pressure ulcer numbers and you're looking at your QRP pressure numbers, they're never going to match. First off, QRP only measures Medicare Part A folks where short or long-term pressure ulcers are looking at the whole house regardless of what the payer source is. And another component here with QRP is that it adds those unstageable pressure ulcers, which are currently not measured in the five-star program. So these two, measure, these two numbers will never be equal to one another when if you're reviewing reports. Then you have your falls with major injury, which we also know is on the five-star report, as well as the quality measures as well. And this one has started 10 one It measures the same way as it does in the five-star um, and the quality measure component. So we're very familiar with that measure. Now, the care plan or the communication of the health information that was supposed to be exchanged, that was also supposed to start 10 one But like I said before, because of HIPAA, and those requirements that are so tight around um, uh, personal identification, personal information that needs to be stay safe, um, they're not sure how they're going to address that. So likely we will have to go out to another type of program to report that back to CMS. So we're maybe talking about October 1st, 2020 for that component. Like I said, there's a TEP panel that's already out there that's sort of working on that for CMS. So that's sort of a wait and see. 
The medication reconciliation uh, and drug regimen review was also started on 10-1-18 as well. We're going to have a couple slides that go into a little bit more detail about that. But again, we're looking at completion of those components and making sure that patients have a drug regimen review um, on admission and throughout their stay while they're on Medicare Part A. Is it a good idea to, to do it on all payer sources? Sure, because it's good patient care to review the medication list to make sure that they're taking everything that they need because as we know, many times hospitals are not giving the patients all of the medications that they take when they go into the hospital. They're only giving those meds that are related to that admission or sort of what they need to keep them alive, you know, those detrimental medications like high blood pressure meds and diabetes, medications for diabetes and those sorts of things. But they're not getting all of the medications that they take when they go into the hospital. In 2017, October 1st of 2017, we added three claims, but they're uh, we, three measures, but they're claims based measures. All the ones that we've talked about so far have been uh, based on the MDS. So they're information that we put into the MDS that CMS takes out for the QRP program. Now, claims based measures are measured a little bit differently. They're measured basically from the claims that we submit, as well as hospital claims, and then any other post acute users. Um, so it looks into, especially with Medicare spending per beneficiary, it's looking at Medicare Part D, it's looking at some of your home health or outpatient um, dollars that are spent for patients, um, you know, once they leave us. We also have the discharge to the community, looking at successful discharges out to the community and then potentially preventable rehospitalizations. We're going to talk more about each one of those measures. So with the SNP QRP program, um, CMS wants us to have improved outcomes, so better results for care. They want us to improve care coordination with our upstream or hospital users, as well as our downstream or home health or outpatient uh, users as well. Improving discharge planning so that when we're discharging patients back home, um, we've done an effective discharge plan. They have the equipment that they need. They have you know, appointments set up and those types of things. Um, allowing comparisons within other groups as well as comparing nursing home to nursing home, but we're also comparing inpatient rehab and LTACs to nursing homes as well. And then the scarier part, research. Okay, so the data that we submit, just like with the PDPM program, the data that we submit on our MDSs, our claims, and our cost reports was utilized to develop the patient-driven payment model. So the research that comes out of it is pretty significant. So the MDS data that's collected through the MDS, again, looking at reporting data, the claims data isn't covered in the 80% reporting requirement because the claims data comes through automatically. There's nothing that you need to do on the provider side. So when you're looking at CMS saying that 80% of the MDSs that are submitted have to have 100% of the data that's reported um, for the QRP information, which includes covariates. So sometimes there's missing data that helps you to determine um, certain covariates, like with pressure ulcers. One of the things of the covariates is, um, is the bed mobility. Is the patient able to change their position in bed if they needed to, or do they need assistance with that? So if bed mobility is dashed out, it can't give you the information as far as that covariate when it comes to pressure ulcers. So it may look like you have um, not reported that information in your MDS. So keep that in mind. The other thing I just want to mention here is you should not be submitting managed care MDSs unless they satisfy an OBRA requirement. So unless it's a significant change in admission, an annual or a quarterly, if you're doing PPS MDSs alone for managed care, they should not be submitted. OK, number one, it's a violation of HIPAA because CMS is not the payer nor the, the, the treater or the provider for that patient. The managed care company is. So to report that information to CMS, you're violating HIPAA. The second thing is, why would you want additional quality measures to, to go against you that you didn't even need to report? So, for instance, if you're doing a 14-day managed care MDS and you submit that to the federal repository and the patient had a fall with major injury, now you've added another fall with major injury to your facility report that you didn't even need to report in the first place. So you're hurting yourself by doing that. 
And the second component is that there's a 2% penalty for not reporting the requirements um, that CMS has asked us in the, in the MDS, okay? So when if you do get a 2% penalty, that's enforced for the entire year. And that's every Medicare patient every day, you get 2% less than you would have had you reported this information. So that's sort of your, your, your penance or your slap on the wrist for not reporting this data. Okay, and since it's reported through the MDS, the only ways to, to not report data is not reporting that information, dashing it out, or sometimes there's a patient who you are under the impression is of one payer source, and you find out later on in the stay that the person is really Medicare, and you didn't have the information at that time collected to be able to get that to CMS. So if that is a problem in your facility, that can end up to um, you know reporting less than 80% and end up in a 2% payment reduction. Okay, so the quality reporting measures, you have your newer worsening pressure ulcers, again, which will be changed to um, changes in skin integrity, which now also include unstageable wounds due to slough or eschar. Your falls with major injury, your admission and discharge functional assessment with a care plan that addresses function. So even though CMS doesn't have an electronic way for us to report that care plan, the expectation is that all of the goals that you report in section GG will be on the resident's care plan. Okay, so keep that in mind as we move forward. So when we're looking at those changes in functional independence, the percentage of patients with admission and discharge functional assessments and the care plan that addresses function is that full measure. That's the name of the full measure. So it measures the effectiveness of your rehab programs through the resident outcomes. So that's what they're looking at as far as are you maintaining good outcomes? They're going to determine that through this data. It's expected that you have at least one goal, but you may want to add more goals, especially when CMS is going to look at the percentage of goals that were uh, reached by your resident by the time they were discharged off of Medicare Part A. Now, CMS's goals are not the same goals that you are putting in Section GG. They're sort of like a secret number, I guess I call it where it's a CMS expectation that residents will meet certain goals for discharge, but you have no idea what those thresholds are, only CMS does, okay? So um, again, making sure that you add the goals into your resident's care plan. The other thing is that CMS is expecting, since they gave us this section back in 2016, they're expecting us to collaborate. And so RNs, LPNs, PT, OT, and speech to be able to collaborate on how well that the patient is doing, how they're performing with their section GG information. So I have to say when I get out there and when we're out there consulting and working with folks, we find that probably 80 to 85% of facilities have left section GG to rehab to complete and there's no input from nursing. Um, the, the danger with that is that you're only looking at the amount of time that the resident is with rehab and not the other 23 hours of what that has happening in the building. So we're finding that when we ask CNAs or nursing assistants, especially on the off shifts, you know, second shift and third shift, when we compare the discharge performance to what's actually happening, happening on the unit, there's a huge gap between what we're saying the resident is at for their level of function and what the CNAs are actually seeing for that resident's level of function. There are claims based, which we have talked about. These are newer, these came in in 2017. So they hit your um, 2% reduction, potential 2% reduction um, on 10-1-18. And that's Medicare spending per beneficiary discharge to the community, and those are successful discharges back to the community, potentially preventable 30-day post-discharge readmissions. And again, this measure when you're looking at readmissions is different than quality, than is uh, what's reported in Five Star, and it's different than what's, than what's reported in the value-based purchasing program. This measure is only looking at those discharges that are potentially preventable, and this measure starts 30 days from discharge after you discharge the patient, where the other measures are starting from admission to the skilled nursing facility. This is measuring 30 days after discharge, okay? Not all the same in the different programs. So potentially probably a five star because again, those are all QRP, med 
Medicare Part A patients only. So for this entire program, you're only looking at Medicare Part A patients, not Medicare Advantage, and not any other payer source. The time period is the first 30 days following discharge, including the day of discharge, again, because they're still in the facility, and that following day. So it's looking at 30 days after the patient's discharge from the nursing home. It's going to look at anyone who was readmitted to a hospital or an LTAC um, and has a principal diagnosis that was considered to be unplanned and potentially preventable. Okay, so it's for those folks going back for planned readmissions, they will be excluded. Um, they're looking for the unplanned folks for this measure. So what are some exclusions to the measure? Anyone who was discharged to another skilled nursing facility from the skilled nursing facility, they were discharged to an inpatient rehab facility or discharged to the LTAC, they will be excluded. This is not someone who's gone home first and then is admitted to these um, different levels of care. This is someone that you directly discharge from your skilled nursing facility to one of these other entities. Residents who expire during their Medicare covered um, benefit period are also excluded. If anyone is discharged against medical advice, obviously we didn't have control over them when they were with us. We certainly don't have control over them after discharge, so that will not count against you. Any acute care stays that are uh, residents who are coming in for uh, cancer treatment that were treated in the hospital for cancer or pregnancy. So this is not someone who's coming to you that has cancer but's coming for a fractured hip. This is someone who went to the hospital for treatment of that cancer and they're coming to you. Anyone who exhausts their Medicare benefits during the, um, the Medicare stay would be excluded because you may not be done with their program yet. Just because they ran out of Medicare benefit days doesn't necessarily mean you were done with their outcomes. Any residents that were not Medicare beneficiaries for 12 months before the admission and three months after the admission, because Medicare goes back to look for certain conditions to help um, with risk adjustment here. So that's why they have to maintain Medicare Part A and B for those components. Medicare Part B pays for the outpatient components like the emergency room and other components as well. Transfers to federal hospitals are excluded as well as end-stage renal disease uh, folks are also excluded from that. Most common reasons for readmission, and these are again from CMS, inadequate management of chronic conditions, inadequate management of infections. So something that started off as, uh, you know, maybe an infection, maybe it turned to a cellulitis, maybe it turned to a sepsis, you know, how did it get that bad? So inadequate management of those infections. Inadequate management of other unplanned events where something came up and we didn't know how to manage it and we sent the patient out instead of having a plan. And I think that's what we're getting to with some of the, um, you know, upstream and downstream users, um, making sure that we can understand, you know, what are the things that can possibly happen to a resident with this condition? If that unplanned event does happen, what are we going to do about that? So we have a plan in place. So if, the, if we do have a negative outcome or an unplanned event, we'd know what to do about it instead of just, you know, automatically discharging to the hospital. We tried to manage it in-house or treat in place is another uh, term for that. Or inadequate injury prevention, which we do have a lot of folks that go out, you know, due to falls and those types of things. So those are the four most common reasons that we are readmitting patients back to the hospital. Okay. If someone has multiple skilled nursing facility admissions during the 12 month period, all of them will count. And what I mean by that is if you have someone who is admitted, you discharge them home and they're home for a number of days, then they go back to the hospital and they get readmitted to the nursing home again, um, at another point in time, each one of those admissions counts in the QRP program, okay? So what is a potentially preventable readmission? Well, you have some respiratory conditions. Again, you have COPD, you got asthma, you got bacterial or aspiration pneumonia and the flu, okay? So again, when you're looking at reasons as to why your patients went out to the hospital, so when you're collecting your data, your in-house data on the readmissions that you had, it's not good enough to just report the numbers. You wanna look at why those patients went out. Is there anything that you can learn from these patients um, that you can help to avoid the next patient from having to go to the hospital? So let's say you reviewed your monthly information for January 28, 2019, and you found that you had 13 readmissions in January and 10 of them were related to a respiratory condition. So what do you do then? 
So you may want to go back and look at what do you have in place for your respiratory program for the facility, okay? Do we need to tweak the respiratory program that we've got in place to address, was there something that we missed in the assessment you know, component? Was there, you know, another piece that we may need to add that we can avoid these people from going back to the hospital? Again, what can we learn from the data we collected? Not just collecting data, but what can we learn from it? Your cardiac condition, CHF, hyperhypotension, some arrhythmias can be treated in-house. Um, yes, if someone's in VTAC, you're sending them out to the hospital, of course. Some diabetic complications can be handled in-house. Some pressure ulcers and infections. Septicemia, I'll give you that. That one's definitely touch and go. But how did it get to the level of septicemia? You know, what happened with the infection process and the assessment process and whether we're making progress um, with treating that infection before it got to the level of septicemia? And then your GI, GU components, your UTIs. We should never send anybody back to the hospital for a urinary tract infection in a skilled nursing facility. You know, we're telling them that we're skilled, that we can handle urinary tract infections. Um, so again, those are, you know, some of the types of things that we should be treating in house, C. diff, dehydration. You know, if you don't have IVs, there may be other ways to get fluids into folks um, that may be acceptable in your, in your level of care. Um, electrolyte imbalances again, intestinal impaction. How did it become intestinal impaction? It, it, it would have been constipation before it became an impaction. So who missed the three-day bowel regime? You know what I mean? So if we're not even doing our own assessments and following our own protocols, then yes, patients can end up in the hospital. And some of these conditions, like we'd mentioned, were potentially preventable. If we follow the bowel regime and handle that patient when they were constipated, they may not have ever gotten to the level of an intestinal impaction. Okay, so discharge to the community, we're looking at, that's also a variation on what's reported in the five-star component. Again, we're only measuring Medicare Part A folks, which is similar to in five-star, they're also only measuring Part A folks. This is looking at 31 days post-discharge to the community. It's gonna measure how successful your facility is with keeping patients out in the community for 30 days and keeping them healthy. OK, meaning that there are no unplanned rehospitalizations and oh, get ready for this. you got to keep them alive for the 31 days after you discharge them. OK, so again, your hospice folks will be excluded from this that are going to be discharged on hospice. So they're not going to count against you. But again, we're going to have to find that sweet spot, especially as we move into PDPM, where rehab days and minutes are not our daily focus anymore. You know, we need to give the patients enough care and services that they have good outcomes and they can stay healthy in the community for 30 days. So sometimes being a part of an ACO works against you because they're telling you when they want the patient discharged, regardless of the patient's condition. So they're not looking at the patient as a whole. They're not looking at the other comorbidities. They're only strictly looking at numbers, okay? which in turn we're seeing in many of the articles that are getting written now and some of the trade journals that are out there that shorter length of stays cause increased rehospitalization. You may even be seeing that in your own facilities now. Okay, so we have to sort of find that delicate balance. Another component that we have to think about are discharge status codes on some of the claims, making sure that we've got the appropriate discharge status code um, so that when the patient is measured as far as the discharge to the community, we've got the right folks. So we're looking at discharge to the hospital versus discharge to home. And then in the parentheses, you can see three additional codes. These were added by CMS back in 2013. Um, the 81 would represent someone who has a planned readmission but is going uh, home to the hospital or home with services, 81, 82, and 86. I did have one facility that tried to test these codes with one of the MACs and um, they, they didn't allow them to go through. So I would suggest that if you did have a planned um, readmission that was going home or going back to the hospital for that planned readmission, um, test those codes with your own MAC to see if they work. But even um, if you're just you know testing the code, if you're just using the general 01 or 02 for discharge home or discharge to the hospital, how is that information being communicated to the finance folks that that's where this patient's going? So that should be something that we're going to talk about for some folks, especially with planned readmissions on what we're reporting for discharge status codes. 
All right, um, other exclusions for discharge to the community. So if someone is discharged to a psych hospital, they're excluded from this measure. If they're discharged to a hospice facility or to community hospice, they are not measured in this measure. They are excluded. If they're discharged to law enforcement, and yes, sometimes that happens to us, um, those folks would also not be included. Your AMAs, we had talked about that. If they're leaving against medical advice, they are excluded. If they're discharged to another skilled nursing facility, those folks are also excluded. If their acute care stay is for cancer or like we had uh, mentioned the pregnancy component. Um, the cancer folks are also dis uh, excluded from the discharge of the community. If your patient has a planned readmission back to the hospital, those planned discharges for the readmission are excluded. And if they benefit exhaust during their Medicare stay with us. So let's say someone comes in and they only have 15 Medicare days left and to get them to the outcome that we need, we needed 30 days or 25 days or something like that those folks would not count against us. They would be excluded from this measure. Medicare spending per beneficiary is a little more technical, let's say. This is also claims-based. It um, is looking at Medicare Part A folks, but it includes spending from Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B, because again, Medicare Part B pays for some outpatient components. Okay. Um, the goals that CMS had when they gave us this measure was to improve care coordination and efficiency of care. So section GG in that care plan that's going to follow the resident is going to help with that. So for instance, let's say we're looking at oral hygiene in section GG <clears throat> and the patient is able to brush their teeth, but they're not able to squeeze the toothpaste onto the toothbrush. Okay, so now when we discharge that patient over to home health and they get the occupational therapist in at the home health level to come in, she knows right where she needs to pick up with this patient. Oh, okay, they got to her to be able to brush her teeth. I need to work with her on fine motor skills so I can get her to be able to squeeze the toothpaste out of the, out of the toothpaste container into onto the toothbrush, okay? So it makes us more efficient. We're not repeating what's already been done in the previous level of care. It's able to be able to facilitate comparisons of facilities for other folks that have the same acuity as your building. So if you're a busy 700 bed with an average daily census of 120 Medicare patients and you got a vent unit and all types of stuff, you're not gonna be compared to a 20 bed skilled nursing facility unit in a CCRC, a continuing care and retirement community. OK, you're going to be compared to someone that has a similar acuity within their facility. OK, but they're going to compare your spending to someone that does have a similar acuity to say, are you overspending or underspending based on what CMS is seeing for other facilities that are similar to yours? They want to create accountability amongst providers for quality and value by measuring the resources that they use for the entire episode of care. So if someone comes in for a fractured hip, okay, they fall down at home, they go to the emergency room, the clock starts ticking with that component when they get admitted to the hospital. It's still the same episode of care if they went to an inpatient rehab facility, let's say, and then if they came to us afterwards, and then they go to home health. That's all one episode of care for that fractured hip. They're counting how much we spend for the entire episode of care. So just want to warn you that the dollars that you're spending for the episode of care are being um, rolled up to CMS while they're under your roof. So in the inpatient stay, as well as the 30 days post discharge. So you are being held accountable for how much home health is spending or that second, you know, your discharge um, setting. So when they get discharged to the next setting, do they still need care and services for that fractured hip or whatever condition that they came to you for? Because all that spending gets rolled up and, and will be reported against your facility, okay? All right, so exclusions, planned hospital readmissions are excluded from Medicare spending. Routine management of certain pre-existing conditions. So if you have a patient that's coming to you for a fractured hip, but they also have diabetes, the um, diabetic strips and all the testing equipment does not count against you. That's a pre-existing chronic condition that they have. So that spending would not go against you. They just want to look at what additional spending the resident is utilizing for that fractured hip. Okay. Um, routine screening and healthcare maintenance. So mammograms and, and, um, pap smears and pros, uh, prostate screenings and those type of things do not count against you either. You know, your vaccinations and those types of things. 
Immune modulating medications, why is that the only one? I have no idea, but just so you know that those are excluded as well. And like we mentioned, they have to have Medicare Part A for at least 90 days before the episode and at least 30 days post episode for the Medicare spending. For the discharge to the community, it's a prior, it's a whole year of Medicare Part A and B prior to the admission. There's a boatload of risk adjustment that has to do with the prior level of care that they were at, what services they received, what their age is, certain clinical categories, components like that, that are going to offset that spending because they want to capture as many chronic conditions so that that doesn't work against you, that spending doesn't work against you. All right, so this is the calculation. The MSPB post-acute care amount is on the top of the line, and the bottom is the national median MSPB post-acute amount of spending. If your final value is over 1.0, you're overspending what the average is. And if your final number is zero point something, then you are underspending. So it's, if it's over one, you're spending more than the national median. If it's under one, you're spending less than the national median. This is an example on this slide of six different episodes of care. You can think of them as six different patients, okay? So with episode number one, under uh, the first line, observed spending, the facility spent about $3,300 on this patient. If you follow the column down, the, they expected spending was about $4,000. So CMS expected you would have spent about $4,000 on this patient and you only spent $3,300 on this patient. So your ratio of observed spending to expected spending is under. You spent 0.825 or 82.5% of the dollars that they allocated for you. Okay, now look at episode number two. You spent 4890, CMS thought you should have only spent 4100. So we overspent on that one and our ratio was 1.193. So then episode three, our ratio was 1.06. Moving over to episode four, we underspent 0 0.850. Episode five, 1.161. And then episode six, 1.092. OK, so all of those ratios added together on the far right gives you the 6.207. OK, so as we take that information in the 6.207, we're going to divide that by the six different episodes that we had to give us an average ratio. So for this facility, their average ratio is 1.035. Now we're going to compare that to the national spending. We're going to compare it to the national observed spending. Then we're going to compare it to the national median of MSPB post-acute care um, amount of spending. Okay, so there's two different um, comparisons that CMS is doing. So when you compare your 1.035 to the national observed spending amount, which is $5,325, that's a CMS given number they tell us what the national spending is. It appears as though you are overspending, and you can see that in green, to $5,509. So I would be a little worried if I were this facility, but we're not done with the comparisons. So when we move down to the national median uh, post-acute care MSPB amount, that's a little bit higher at $5,700. Again, this is another CMS given number. OK, so we compare your spending at 5509 to the 5700 that CMS thought that post acute care providers are spending the average. You come under one. You're at 0 0.996. So you've underspent and you're still OK, even though for four five of the episodes above. Oh, I'm sorry. Four of the six episodes above you overspent. But when you compare to what the rest of the country is spending, you still ended up being OK. All right, so that's the MSPB component. This is a copy of what one of the reports look like. Okay, so you can see there'll be facility information up along the top. There'll be a legend. On the far left, it's asking for Medicare spending per beneficiary. It's going to compare your center to a national number. So for this center, they had 21 eligible episodes. That's the number of el eligible episodes that they had. They're comparing them to 6 million episodes nationwide. And then if you look in the, um, in the average spending per episode columns, you have the spending during the treatment period, which is under your roof, the skilled nursing facility component. The next column is the spending during the associated services period. And that's the 30 days after you discharge the patient. 
okay, so for a total spending of 16216 I have to tell you, I looked at a couple facilities, and the 30-day associated services period is higher than the inpatient stay. So you might want to have a conversation with your downstream users of home health or however you're discharging your patients to find out how much they're spending because that's working, that's going to go against you. So MSPB amount, again, your average risk adjusted component spending, the national median, and then your final MSPB score. And in this, for this facility, they're 0 0.95. So they are under the national average for spending. Other additional QRP measures that began 10-1-18, we talked about the drug regimen review, changes in skin integrity. We talked about what was added to that, your unstageables for SLUF or SCAR. For looking at change in self-care score and change in mobility score from admission to discharge, okay? Did your patient get better from where they started to where they ended the Medicare, when you ended Medicare for them, when they no longer were on program? And then your discharge self-care and mobility scores, okay? And again, that threshold does not come from your discharge goals. It comes from CMS discharge goals, okay? So we don't know what those numbers are. But keep in mind, these four measurements that are being measured since 10 one in addition to the two above those, will hit your SNF quality reporting um, threshold for 10 one So these are some of the components that you can potentially get slapped on the risk for come October 1st, in addition to what's happening with PDPM, okay? So drug regimen review includes a medication reconciliation, but that's where it starts. That's not where it ends. That's a piece of the drug regimen review. You have to review all the meds that they're taking, including um, any, you know, any I, potentially clinically significant issues that you may find. You're not just looking at the drugs they were taking in the hospital. You're also looking at the drugs that they were taking at home, supplements, herbals, other components, because they could be taking a supplement to manage a condition. Okay. So that's important under DRR, drug regimen review. But when you move over to PDPM, <clears throat> this component's also going to be important under that because drug regimen review is going to force you to look at what they were taking at home, which may reveal some additional conditions or diagnoses that you did not get through the hospital. So let's say someone's taken an herbal product to manage depression, okay? And the hospital didn't give them that herbal product when they came into the hospital, and therefore it never got onto the discharge summary or the med list, and you didn't know that they were doing anything. You didn't even know that they had a diagnosis of depression. Okay, so when we move into PDPM, the uh, when that system's gonna be based on patient conditions, the higher the case mix weight, the higher the rate, and then the case mix weight is dependent on conditions. So you could have some conditions that you were unaware of based on drug regimen review, based on what medications or other components that they were taking at home. So keep that in mind as you move into PDPM. The drug regimen review also includes parenteral TPN and oxygen. Okay, which is very strange because it isn't usually considered a drug, but under drug regimen review it is. So you're looking for clinically significant medication issues that are actual or potential issues that, in our judgment, warrant physician communication. So if you need to talk to the doc to get something clarified or verified, that potentially has a clinically significant medication issue attached to that. And that has a deadline of having to get that done by midnight of the next calendar day. Okay. So the way that we look in the CMS report QRP program is it's going to give us some of the quality um, measure components. It's going to give us review and correct reports, which are out now for the fourth quarter of 2018. So you should be looking at that information if you have not done so already. Now is the time to get that corrected. You only have until May 15th to make those corrections. Once CMS closes the window, um, you can no longer make corrections to your QRP data for that quarter. Okay. They will also give you provider preview reports to let you know how you are doing um, so they can, you can work on programs and then they're going to post it to the website, the nursing home compare website. Okay. This is where you go in to get your quality reporting um, reports out. Your QRP reports are in the Casper component. So if you've never seen them, it's a good idea. When you go under, go under your report categories on the left-hand side, you're going to look for SNF quality reporting program. You're going to double click on that. And then your different reports should show up on the right side here. So if you have not done so, I would get everything off that's in there so I can become familiar with it. 
but minimally your review and correct reports are available now so that you can look and make any corrections to any MDS data if you have errors in it. Again, this is the queued up reports. You're just going to be able to double click on that once you've gotten it queued up and be able to print that off. I would suggest that you make copies for the administrator, the director of nursing and MDS so that all folks are aware of what you're looking at and what may needs and what your stats are. So quarter one, two, three, and four, okay, we're looking at that information. So you can see down the bottom quarter four is December, is October 1st through December 31st. You have from January 1st through May 15th to get that corrected, okay? So February 15th is coming up. So your third quarter data, if you have not pulled that already, you've got a couple more days to get that information corrected. February 16th, you will no longer be able to make corrections to the July 1st through September 30th, 2018 data that you've got in the system, okay? This is a copy of a pressure ulcer report for someone. It's giving you all four quarters. It starts down the bottom with quarter one, then up to two, up to three, up to four. It's looking at start and end dates for the actual quarter. They go by calendar quarter, so they're kind of easy to follow. It'll tell you whether the quarter is still open or when it, if it's been closed. It'll tell you the number of folks that triggered for this condition. And in this report, we're looking at newer worsening pressure ulcers. So um, they, on fourth quarter 2017, they had three folks out of 73 that developed pressure ulcers for a sniff performance rate of 4.1%. Moving down the column, third quarter was 2.4, second quarter was 3.1, first quarter was 4.3. For a total accumulation of 10 residents out of 280 that developed pressure ulcers that then got risk adjusted for a SNF observed performance rate of 3.6%. So right now, like I said, it's a, it's a compliance measure. You need to report in section M your pressure ulcer information and then any covariates that you have in section G. But this data at some point in time will be used to compare to other nursing homes. So if other nursing homes around the country are only at a 1.8% and you're at a 3.6, you could very well lose revenue because you are over the acceptable threshold. That's what's gonna happen with this information down the road in our lifetimes. This next report is falls with major injury. Again, it's similarly reported. You can see the facility information up top. The other one was just a little bit bigger. Um, and their average is um, 1.5 average for the entire year. You know, they had a bad quarter here, second quarter of 2017, where they had three folks out of 60 that developed, that had falls with major injury for a total of 5%. But when you average that out through the year, which is what CMS will do, they come down to 1.5%. Okay, this is the resident level data. This will tell you all of your patients that are triggering for these events or not triggering. OK, now on this report falls with major injury and pressure ulcers. The NT means that the person didn't develop a pressure ulcer or have a fall. When you're looking at the report for Section GG, long term care assessment for admission and discharge with functional assessment and a care plan that attached to that, you're looking for them to um, trigger. You're wanting them to trigger because it's assessing that you did have that for that patient. You did have an assessment at admission and you did have an assessment at discharge for that PPS patient. Okay, so you want them to read a little bit differently. You want them to trigger there. You don't necessarily want them to trigger here unless they did have the event, the fall or the pressure ulcer, if it's real. All right, so we talked about if CMS is going to be able to report the rolling quarters. 100% of the information needs to be in at least 80% of the MDSs that are coming through. Otherwise, you're going to suffer a 2% reduction. If you get a patient at the end of 2018 and they had a pressure ulcer that came out on January 5th of 2019, that pressure ulcer will show up in that first quarter of 2019. It's not based on admission. It's based on the assessment reference date of the MDS with the event that triggered for that quality measure. Your review and correct reports are updated every Monday morning, early in the morning, and the data is calculated uh, on the first day of the month after the quarter closes. So like I said, December 31st, the data that you've submitted for the fourth quarter of 2018 was available 1-1-2019. How scary is that? This is a copy on the screen of what a um, 
non-compliance letter would look like if it came to you from CMS. Just wanted to show you what that's, I've heard them called many different late names, nasty gram, CMS hate letter, whatever. <laughs> so some things about um, moving it to PDPM and GG, looking at who fills out GG? Who's the sort of the team leader, the person that owns Section GG? Are you getting information for all your Medicare Part A residents? You know, how are you getting the information? Who's documenting? When are they documenting? What were they using? Is it electronic? Is it paper? How will you determine what usual performance is versus what's best or worst for the patient? We don't just want them at their best. Who's going to care plan those goals? Um, is that information on the care plan goals going to be relayed to the direct care staff? Because the CNAs need to know what those goals are. Um, looking at um, making sure that you have documentation, especially for those people that have fluctuations in how they perform. You're only looking at what is this person going to be able to do at the end of the PPS day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I don't need to know, well, they have five Medicare days left when they come to me. I only want to know what are they going to be able to do on day five. Not if they go over to Part B uh, rehab and when they were done with the program. At the end of the PPS stay is what you're measuring. Again, making sure that you're talking about functional performance, your admission performance and discharge. Are we still on goal to meet on track to meet these goals? That should be becoming part of your Medicare meeting on a weekly basis. You may, if you've only been adding one goal per patient, you may want to consider one in self-care and one in mobility, especially if they're looking at two different quality measures now. And again, if you're not happy with your performance, you can utilize that for performance improvement projects under QAPI. Okay. So when you're managing QRP compliance, be timely with your MDSs, making sure that you're meeting submission requirements, that you're aware of how the, the MDS completion uh, affects quality measures. Um, have you reviewed discharge um, status codes for those people that are going back for planned readmissions. And again, looking for upstream and downstream users and looking at those components for your quality measures is another piece. Now, in the middle, in the middle between all of these programs, your QRP program, your five-star program, and value-based purchasing, there is one measure that hinges all of these together, and that is rehospitalizations. So if we mentioned be in the beginning, if there's only one measure that you can work on, it's Rehospitalizations would be your best bet because it hits three different programs. So you can have improvement in three different programs. Value based purchasing also came out in 2014 as part of the Protecting Access to Medicare Act. It started 10 1 18 as far as your reduction in payment. It shows it shows CMS who's considered a valuable player in the skilled nursing facility big game by looking at who can do it with the best outcomes without the rehospitalizations by also reducing their costs, okay? So that's what they're sort of looking at. So what this measures is two components, an achievement component and an improvement component. The achievement is looking at your facility against other nursing homes in the country. The improvement rating is looking at your facility at one point in time against your facility at another point in time. So initially when we got the, um, reductions or the improvements in 2018, you were looking, you have to pay 2% of your Medicare rate just to fund the program. So it's not asked, it's a requirement and it comes right out of your rate. Now, like a game show, you can buy your money back up to between 50 and 70%. CMS decided that it would be 60% this past year that would go back to providers. However, they anticipated that 40% of providers would be getting some revenue back and 60 probably would not. It turns out that only 27% of us got revenue back because our rehospitalization rates were going in the wrong direction. Okay. They're using the all cause, all condition measure, but we, uh, we anticipate that they will move over to that potentially preventable, which is risk adjusted, which will sort of reduce the readmission um, numbers, but potentially not the percentages. So again, risk standardized, all cause, all condition. It doesn't matter why they go back to the hospital. This starts with 30 days from the hospital discharge and they come to you the day, at least within one day of the hospital discharge. They use Medicare claims for this, just like in QRP. It doesn't matter if your patient, if you guys sent your own patient out from your facility or if they only stayed, let's say 10 days, you still have a 20 day responsibility in the community for them. So if they went back to the hospital within a 30 day window, whether it, they were under your roof or not under your roof, it still counts against you. 
there's some risk adjustment for demographics and diagnosis and how long they were in the hospital and were they in ICU. This also excludes planned readmissions and we're using the rehospitalization re measure um, this current year. So the way it works is that it's looking at, this is the improvement rating. It's looking at your nursing home in 2015 against your nursing home in 2017. If you did better in 2017 and reduced the number of readmissions that you had in 2017 over what you had in 2015, you got up to 90 points on this side of the equation. The next side of the equation is the achievement measure, and that's measuring you against all nursing homes in 2015. So up here on the green line, it's your skilled nursing facility. Down on the bottom, it's all skilled nursing facilities in 2015. You have to be at least better than the bottom 25% of folks were in 2015. Their rehospitalization numbers during that point in time was 20.41. So if you're sitting with a rehospitalization measure in 2017, that's 21% or higher, you already know you're not getting any revenue back on this side. You're shooting for the, um, the, on the top banner, the benchmark, which is the top 10% of performing facilities back in 2015, which was 83.6 is their treat in place rate. Okay, so 16.4 is their rehospitalization rate. And that's what you're trying to get to, is to reduce it down to 16.4% or less. And on this side, you get up to 100 points for value-based purchasing. I know we're running a little bit over, but we only have a couple slides left here. So hang in there with me. So again, either you get, you get, you're looking at the number of patients that you did not readmit. So if you have 100 patients in a bucket and you sent 20 base patients back to the hospital, that means you're treating the remaining 80 patients under your roof. So you're treating 80% in place. You want to increase that 80% number to as close to 100 as you can get to win this VVP game. Okay, so how did you do in 2017 compared to all nursing homes in 2015? That's the achievement score. You can get up to 100 points. And then the second part is how did your facility do in 2017 compared to your facility in 2015? That's the improvement score and you can get up to 90 points. The data that you need to pay attention to this year is this achievement threshold and benchmark that's on this next slide. The achievement threshold is 80.218. That's the treat in place number. You want your treat in place number to be at least that good for this year. And you're trying to get to 83.721 or the benchmark, okay? These are presented in, uh, reported in decimals, but we're just converting them over to percentages. All right, so here we are. With in 2016, the 25th percentile has a readmission rate of 19.782, so you gotta be better than that, okay? And the mean of the best decile went from 16.4 down to 16.279, so that's what you're trying to achieve. You wanna be in between these two numbers. You don't wanna be higher than 19.782, but you're okay to be lower than 16.279, okay? Those are your performance scores that will hit you 10 one nineteen. I just wanted to include this slide really quickly because people get confused by this national average readmission rate on the far right hand side. That 1909 is not your goal. We mentioned in the previous screen, the, um, that's barely the, 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 barely the bottom percentile of the, of the folks for 2016. So if your risk standardized readmission rate is 18.76, you probably want to work to get that closer to 16 or lower when you can. This is just looking at the eligible, the supplemental workbook that you have access to that's gonna give you all of your readmissions for the prior year. You have access to that in your CASPER reports already. Okay, you can pull that up and you're gonna be looking for those patients that had readmissions. It's going to identify it by putting a number one in that column. All right, your value-based purchasing reports, again, you get them off your Casper folder in your inbox, your facility inbox over here, which is the second one down. If you don't find it there, look at all of your inboxes because we've seen some funky things out there. And then this last information, you're looking at the very last line. These are reports that have come to you from CMS, your incentive multiplier. If it's below the number one, you're getting less than the um, CMS stated rate. If it's above 1.0, you're getting extra money over and above your CMS rates. And that's how they apply that component to the VBP. 
So look at your readmissions, like we said before, look for trends. Do you need to change your programming? Do you need to talk to your staff about how to treat in place? Is it a staff competency issue? And again, monitoring it on a regular basis um, so that you are uh, keeping in tune with what you're looking at. So Wendy, I'm gonna hand it back to you to open it up to see if we have questions from folks. And thank you so much, everyone. All right, I don't see anything in the chat box. Um, and the handouts are available in the handout tab for folks who did not um, download the handouts prior to. Those are available to you right now. You can go into the handouts tab and it's a PDF. It'll say quality and value, PHCA. Okay, and if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to stay on um, to address those if anybody has any. All right, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So thank you all so much for joining us. I'm sure Wendy will be sending out an evaluation. Um, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Take care, everyone.